Father, we thank you so much for this evening. Thank you so much for allowing us to be in this place, Father. We just ask your blessing upon it. Lord, we ask your blessing as we open up your word tonight. And as we read and study, Lord God, that you would give us what we need tonight, Lord God. That we would also honor and glorify you in all that we do here. Yeah. And we lift up our prayer needs, Lord God. Uh, uh, you know all of them, Lord. We will talk about them later, God. But we just ask that you would move in all of those situations tonight, Lord God. There's so many, Lord. So many things going on. Hmm. There's also a lot of mess going on, Lord, but you know about that. You told us it was going to happen. Help us stand strong in you tonight. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You be seated. Good evening. Good evening. How is everyone doing tonight? Blessed. Good, 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 good. Acts chapter 16. Well, we'll go back to the end of chapter 15 for a minute because I need to pick up with a couple of things. I think I dropped the ball on last week. So last week, um, well, we, as we studied chapter 15, and we know that the council in Jerusalem met, and uh, again, they heard all the testimony, they had a meeting and made a decision that they are going to ask the Gentile believers just to abstain from doing four things. Um, for fellowship, not for salvation, we talked about that. Um, again, said that they would abstain from meats offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from fornication. And again, not for salvation, just for fellowship and for worship purposes uh, with the Jewish people. And I would mentioned that um, uh, Paul had talked about that, and I mentioned Corinthians, and I mentioned Romans, and I just couldn't remember where it was at, and so I said, you know what, I need to go look it up, so I did look it up, and it's 1 Corinthians 10, 25 through 32, 1 Corinthians 10, 25 through 32, and Paul, again, uh, speaking to people, um, says, whatsoever sold in the shambles or in the meat market, that eat, asking no questions for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. In other words, don't go up asking questions, will this meat used to worship an idol? Was it not? Just go buy the meat. If you see the meat, you want the meat, go buy the meat. Right. Okay? That's what he's saying. Because why? Everything belongs to the Lord. Right. All of it's here. It says, then in verse 27, it says, If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, and you be disposed to go, Whatsoever set before you, eat, asking no questions for conscience' sake. But if any man say unto you, This is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake, that showed it, and for conscience' sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that for which I give thanks? Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense, neither to the Jews nor to the Gentiles nor to the church of God. And so, you know, Paul's telling them to listen again. You go to the meat market, buy some meat. Somebody invites you over. You know, and they got a nice uh, rack of lamb there. You say, oh, man, that looks good. Now, they come up. Somebody comes up and says, you know, that was sold at the temple and used in the idol for idol worship. Then at that time, don't eat it. Why? Because you don't want to offend the brother. Mm -hmm. And what's this guy probably doing by telling you that? Go see whether you're going to eat it or not. That's right. And so just don't eat it. No big deal. When you get home, you can have a rack of lamb at home. It doesn't matter. And so, again, why... Is Paul saying this here for unity's sake? And so, just for folks to get along, he goes on in chapter 14 and talks about, um, you know, years ago I was a, uh, um, now that's Romans 14, but I, I, I was a vegetarian for a while. I ate vegan because I was in real bad health and all. And um, 
we're a Bible study and uh, somebody read in Romans 14 and it talked about the brother who is weak only eats meat or only eats <laughs> vegetables and the guy that was talking turned around and went, sorry Greg, and I went, it's not offending me, I'm not weak in the faith, I'm just, you know, trying to get some health stuff going on here, it is all that's happening and so it didn't bother me, but again, uh, chapter 14, he just talks about uh, these things, listen, you know, if your brother, you know, if you go out to eat with a bunch of vegetarians and they... You know they're gonna get offended. You order a big old steak, don't order a big old steak. Just right. kind of nibble on some something till you get home, and then you know go get right. your steak or whatever yep. you want, right? Yeah. I mean it's easy. And so uh, again, we do it out of love for our fellow man. But at the end of the day, uh, he's saying it's not like I'm gonna always do that because why should I be restricted just because of their conscience? Right. But if I'm there eating with them, you know what? I'm I'm honored. It's good. It's okay within reason. And so I want to cover that. Also, uh, we know that uh, him and Barnabas got in this big argument about, um, yeah, that guy, Mark. And, um, you know, to the point that they split up. And so we think, well, my, man, that was a pretty bad split. And we know that Mark left and during a period of ministry, but uh, did Mark end up being important in Paul's life? Boy, he sure did. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, in verse 11, and I may have covered this last week. I don't know if I did or not. I had it written down. But uh, Paul in prison, and he's writing uh, the letter to Timothy. And in verse 11, he says, Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Right. And so apparently his time with Barnabas was good because Mark became very important uh, and, and a good uh, leader in the church. And so Paul recognized that down the road. And so they were reconciled and obviously cared for each other very much. And so, again, sometimes problems start, but uh, as good Christians, we uh, can, can work through those things. And again... Uh, Mark ends up being very important in the ministry. So where it was really an issue, as we finished up 15 last week, we see later on that it, uh, he, he serves Paul very well and is very helpful there. So let's pick up with that, uh, with the, uh, chapter 16. And so Paul chose Silas, and he and Silas left, and they went to Syria and Cilicia, uh, again, strengthening in the churches. And so tonight it says, Then came he to Derbe, and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess, and believed, but his father was Greek, which was well, well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him, and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that uh, were ordained of the apostles and elders which were in Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. And so what do we have here? Well, we've got Timothy that comes along now. So Paul and Silas go. And so they're preaching and they're going around visiting these Christians. They're preaching. And what happens? Man, people start coming up and go. You need to check out Timothy, man. He would be good in the ministry. You need somebody to train him. But boy, he'd be good. And so Paul starts to, hey, okay, let me let me check, see what's going on with Timothy. And so uh, finds out that he he's kind of a, a half-blooded Jew. Uh, his, his mom is a Jew. His father's Greek. And but again, he is just boy. The reports about him are good. Man, you need to get this kid, Paul. You need to train him. He's going to be good. <coughs> so then Paul takes him, and what's one of the first things he does? Circumcised. Circumcised. Now, wait a minute. Didn't they just have this big council meeting in Acts chapter 15 and said, hey, listen, uh, these Judaizers are requiring circumcision, and now uh, we're saying you don't have to do all that stuff. And then Paul's against all of that because he's the uh, the uh, uh, for the Gentiles, and he's the preacher to the Gentiles and all. And then he gets this half Jewish, half Gentile boy, and the first thing he does, he takes and circumcises him. Seems kind of like the things disagree, but what the Judaizers are doing is related to salvation. Hmm. 
What Paul is doing with Timothy is related to being able to work effectively among people. Because he's got Jewish blood in him on his mama's side so he can go to the temple and all that good stuff. They ain't going to let somebody uncircumcised go in there. They're not going to want somebody uncircumcised ministering among the Jewish people. And so what's the easiest thing to do? He's got Jewish blood in him. Let's get him circumcised. That way, when I go in these places that are restricted Jewish people that follow those things, he's ready. Hmm. It's been that it will be easier for us to minister to the Jewish people by Timothy being circumcised. And so it has nothing to do with salvation, it just has to do with the opportunity to minister. And again, let me see if I can find it real quick. I get myself in trouble in these times. Now, anyway, Paul at some point says, I have become all things to all men, thereby some might be saved. And so again, uh, and we have to be careful with that. But again, Paul's saying, listen, if I, if I have to get this young man circumcised, you know, Paul would say, if I was half Jewish and half Greek and I need to be circumcised in order to minister to Jewish people, I will become like them in order to mm -hmm. minister to them. And so Paul was willing to do those things to a degree. Now the problem is, is you got ministers nowadays that are just taking that stuff way too far. Yeah, right. You know, and they're saying, well, you know, uh, we need to be like Paul and we need to, uh, you know, uh, be like the brethren. And so, okay, so that mean if they uh, go to the bar and get drunk, that you're going to go sit down in the bar and get drunk well, because I might have an opportunity to minister to them? No. I mean, how far do you take it? Well, well, he smokes crack, and I want to tell him about Jesus, so I guess I'll just smoke some crack with him. Right? No. No. Now, y'all laugh, but I'm telling you, you know, they, they preach, they, they have in church in bars. Yep. And it ain't just the bar's the only spot, and we go sit in the back and have our church service sitting down with a beer or a shot or whatever, and they're drinking, having church. Some folks may not have a problem with that. I do. Yep. I'll be addressing that in a few weeks on a Sunday when we're talking about the uh, lingering effects of sin. Let me leave that alone. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, we need to stop the tape and have a discussion. <laughs> Sorry, folks, we're broadcasting to you. You just have to stand by. <laughs> No, you just you just start chasing those rabbits sometime, uh, yeah, and I didn't want you chasing yes, one tonight. <laughs> All right. So anyway, Paul takes and gets him circumcised, and then what it says, and it's kind of funny too, kind of funny, because in verse four he gets him circumcised, and then they go around telling everybody about the letter that the church sent from Jerusalem, telling them I ain't got to worry about getting circumcised, right? Yeah. But again, the reasons are correct. And so when they get that done, and then all of them take off, and they're going, and they're preaching the gospel, and they're sharing this letter with everyone, saying, hey, look, here's a letter from the apostles and elders of Jerusalem, telling them, asking that you would keep these things, again, for fellowship purposes. Because remember, at the time, there's not a church on every corner like there is today, right? Mm, right. you got a city you got a synagogue in that city. Everybody goes to the synagogue that believes in the God of the Jewish people, okay? So you got the Jewish people that are in the synagogue, and you got Gentiles that go. So the church, a lot of them, what happens on Sabbath? They go to the synagogue, and they go to worship. And so, again, for these Christians, in order for you to not be offensive, just do these four things. All right. And so what happens? Well, the churches are established in the faith and increase in number daily. So the churches are growing. Things are going well. So let's look on to verse 6. Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go to Bithynia, 
but the Spirit suffered them not. And they, passing by Mysia, came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. And so they're traveling around, they're preaching the gospel, but they have places they try to go to. They try to go, hey, let's go to Asia and preach the word. And it's interesting, God says no. <coughs> but they're spreading the gospel. Doesn't matter, God says no. I got somewhere else I need you to be. Right. So sometimes if we're trying to engage in ministry, and man, a door keeps getting slammed in our face, we gotta ask the question. <laughs> now again, sometimes the door gets slammed just because the devil's good at slamming doors, right? That's right. But sometimes it may just be God going, you know what, this is not where I want you right now. I got other things for you to do. I got other people that's gonna take care of Asia. And so we know other disciples go to Asia and they preach the gospel, right? But not these guys, he's got something else. So, uh, again, they try. So they try somewhere else. But again, it says the Spirit, verse 7, suffered them not. So again, they try to go somewhere. The Spirit said, nope, don't want you going there either. So then he has this dream about this man from Macedonia. They receive this call. And so it's like, okay, this must be where we need to go. So this door opens and so if God is closing doors just don't think that every door is going to get shut I need to shut it down because somewhere he's going to open a door where he <coughs> wants us to be involved right. in ministry or to do ministry That's right. and so he's going to open that door we just have to be in tune with it and recognize when it opens you know, and again to use the illustration my wife in Honduras loves Honduras uh is itching to go back to Honduras yes. on a mission trip, right? God has no doubt put on her heart to go to Honduras. He ain't never put on my heart to go, okay? Now, I told her if he ever does, I'll go. It, it won't be a question. You know, I don't fly, but I'll get on a plane. I'll go. I'll get a passport. I'll go, but he ain't, he ain't told me yet. There's no doubt he's told her. And so he'll open those doors. Yeah. And so they go. They see this vision and they go. And says, well, obviously this is where God wants us. So they go. And so we see what happens. Therefore, losing uh, from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis. And from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia and the colony. And we were in that city abiding certain days. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. And so they go and they travel and they get to this city, and they find out that there's a prayer meeting down by the river. Now, why is there a prayer meeting down by the river? Hmm. Well, apparently they don't have a synagogue. Okay? Now, if you go back to the book of Ezekiel, where was it Ezekiel would often go and pray? Down by the river Kibar. And I understand through reading that uh, they say that uh, even after the synagogue got started or before synagogue would start, they would go to a town, to a river in that town, and that's where they'd meet on the banks of the river. And they would have service because in order to start a synagogue, you had to either have, it was seven or ten Jewish men. Ten? Yeah. So seven, so ten Jewish men had to be in that city, and they had to come together and say, "Let's start a synagogue," and then we'll get started. But until you got that number, they couldn't have one. So what do you do? Well, we just go meet by the river, okay? And so, as usual, men, it's the women that are gathered and meeting and praying. 
So they go down, they go to Saturday, they go out in the city where prayer was being made, and they sat down and they spake unto these women. So what do they do? They preach the gospel to them. And there's a certain woman named Lydia, seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, uh, uh, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized, her and her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. Okay, so you've got this woman, Lydia, who is obviously a, a wealthy woman. Now, how do I know she's a wealthy woman? Because she's a seller of purple. Yeah. Now, folks, out of all the dyes they had back then, purple was the most costly. It was the most expensive. It was made from sea slugs. I've heard different things. I've heard shells and I've heard the slime. I'm not sure which of the two. But anyway, whichever it was, and I gathered they were not in great abundance. And also, purple was normally worn by what? Royalty, right? So she's a seller in purple. She sells the royalty. She's getting paid. But she believes in God. And so what happened? Well, Paul and Silas and Tim, probably Timothy, they come down and what do they do? They preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And she believes. And then... <coughs> I don't know if her family's here at the time or if she goes and gets them, but at some point they preach the gospel to the family as well. And what happens? She believes. The Lord opens her heart and she attended. She listened to those things and she believed and she was baptized. You know, I was just watching this thing the other day on YouTube. Y'all you know I watch a lot of preaching and all and, and Bible study and different things on YouTube. And they're still having this discussion about infant baptism. Everywhere you read in the Bible, outside of the Jewish people that had a mikvah, which is a different situation, when we deal with New Testament Christian baptism, it is believers' yeah, baptism. That's right. Because what do we read? Go back to Acts 2.38. What happened? Men and brethren, or 2.37, men and brethren, what should we do? Boy, we messed up. What do we need to do? Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sin. Uh, what happened? We see throughout the Bible. People believe and they're baptized. Mm -hmm. They believe and they're baptized. Uh, Lydia here, she believes and then she's baptized so it's always believers baptism right now there are some denominations and there are times when some will baptize a child or sprinkle a child and they're doing it as a committal act right okay and it's kind of like we do here parents have a newborn they come up here and, and we are, are commit the child to the lord and basically we're not really committing the child who are we committing the parents, the parents. y'all raise that child in church that's right that's who we're committing okay but when we read the bible when you study everywhere i found so far is believer's baptism yes and so again we see that here she's baptized her household baptized, so obviously they heard the gospel, and they believed. And so they, she said, listen, if you judge me to be faithful, Lord, you come stay at my house. And she just kept on, because you know, it's probably like most of us today. Oh, no, I don't want to be an inconvenience. And, you know, we got to, no, you need to come stay at my house. Listen, you just come stay at my house. And so they do. And so they hang out there for a little while. And again, they're preaching the gospel and going around, you know, out daily walking and telling people about Jesus. And so then we see in verse 16, it says, And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. Now, what does the Bible say about divination? And bad. Those people shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Soothsayers, necromancers, people that speak to the dead. 
All right? <coughs> all these palm readers you see driving down the road. And all of them seem, what's the name? Sarah, Sister Sarah, something like that. Like Somebody. Most of them are like Sister Sarah. Don't go to them. Some of them are fraudulent. Some of them probably legitimate to a degree because they got a demon. Mm, that's right. And these people that say, well, I talked to my dead loved one. No, you talked to a demon. Yeah. That impersonated your dead loved one. Because that's what they do. And so this is wrong. It is against the word of God. God specifically talks about this. And so they meet this damsel, and she's possessed of the spirit of divination. She's got this demon. And so she brings her masters a whole lot of money. So they probably got her. They'll have somebody sit down, you know, like they just got the crystal ball and all. All right? And speaking on that, don't be going looking for your daily horoscope every day either, because that's wrong too. Okay? So the same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. So these men are walking around trying to talk to people, and you got this dead demon possessed woman, this soothsayer, that's walking around behind them going, Hey, these guys, they're preaching Jesus, they're <coughs> preaching the Savior, they're preaching the way of salvation. And you think right off the bat, well, man, that's pretty good. I mean, this demon is telling the truth. But man, why in the world do we need a help from a demon mm. to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? And if the demon's saying this, he sure ain't saying it with pure motives. He's got something up his sleeve. Right. Because what may happen, if Paul and them don't handle this situation, and then eventually they leave, and this woman didn't come around spouting that, and they said, well, if she was telling the truth, they didn't rebuke her. So I guess we need to listen to her about everything. And then what's going to happen? Going to start steering away from Jesus Christ. Going to start steering more towards Satan. Steering more towards the thing in the world. Steering more toward idols. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So if you don't deal with it now and you just act like everything's okay, then when you leave, boy, that's when it's going to get started. And so what looks like not that big a deal is actually a pretty big deal. So again, verse 18, she did this many days. And Paul finally got to the point he had enough. Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that same hour. Amen. Oh, should I chase this rabbit? <laughs> You know, folks, at the end of the day, people have to stand before God. They don't have to stand before That's me. Right. That's right. But everywhere I read in the Bible, somebody that belonged to Jesus or Jesus himself rebuked the demon and said, get out. They were gone. It ain't all this hours and days and, and using crosses and, and, and um, you know, laying your Bible on their chest. And, and again... I'm not saying that stuff is not going to help in the situation. I'm just saying, when you read in Scripture, demon get out, they go. Right. And sometimes nowadays, it's just like it's some hours, hours, hours. Now, again, at the end of the day, I may get to heaven, and the Lord may say, yeah, Greg, it was hours long, but that's just how I had it, and I don't have to apologize. But I'm just saying, when I look in Scripture, I see instant relief from demon possession. Right. Okay. And so we see here. Demon came out. When her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them in the marketplace on the rulers. In other words, that cash cow he just went. Yeah. That money's gone. That demon's gone. And so they're, they're upset. So they arrest Paul and Silas. Well, they don't arrest them. They catch them. And they take them to the rulers in the marketplace and brought them to the magistrates saying, these men being Jews <coughs> do exceedingly trouble our city. And they're walking around causing all kinds of problems. They teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. You know, what customs did they really teach? The Romans 
with no bail. Well, I don't know about this time, but I can tell you later on in history, during the time of the Spanish Inquisition and one of the other Inquisitions, one of the accusations made against Jewish people is they were vampires because they drank blood. Mm. You better watch them Jews. They'll go steal your baby and drink blood. Now, of course, they're talking about drinking the cup. Right. Right? They're talking about communion. But, you know, people can take one little word and run with it. So a lot of Jewish people that believed in Jesus and a lot of Christians got killed because of that. So oh, you better watch them. It could be something similar. It could be something else. But whatever it is, they're teaching strange customs that are not lawful for us to receive. Now, it could be, too. The Romans believed in many gods. Even the, uh, Caesar was God, right? But he was not the God. He was just one of many gods. And so we hear about all these Christians that are killed by the Romans, by the Caesars and all throughout history. And the whole point was not that they believe in Jesus as God. It's that they only believed in Jesus as God. Okay? Okay. Now, there was a time when you had to come up and you had to pay a coin uh, and you had to say Caesar is God or something like that. And the Christians just said, we ain't doing it. We believe in one God. Caesar ain't God. And so that's why they got thrown to the wild animals and burned at the stake. And all the stuff that happened to them that happened is because they refused to acknowledge all the other gods. That may be what they're talking about here. You know, because the Romans just said, listen, there's even historical records uh, of them saying, listen, yeah, you believe in this Jesus, that's fine. But believe in our gods too. And you're good. We'll let you go. Have a great day. That's all they had to do. But they said, no. We only bow the knee to one Lord and one Savior, and his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. That's why everything was happening and happened. And so, listen, these things are not lawful for us to observe. And so a multitude, verse 22, rose up together against them, and the magistrate rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And they, when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And so they arrest them without a trial. We don't like what they're doing. They're, they're violating law as far as we're concerned, taking for the magistrates. The magistrates, yeah, beat them, lock them up, we're good with them. So they beat them. You know, Apostle Paul talks later about the many stripes that he received, the 39 stripes. Now, it's interesting, if you read the Bible, it was 40 stripes, no more than 40 stripes. So why do we always read the New Testament about 39 with the Jewish people? Well, it's because they didn't want to make sure they didn't miscount and violate the right. law of God. So they did one less just to make sure in case they were counting in there, they missed something somewhere. That's what they did. So they wanted to make sure. And so they take, they beat them, and then once they do that, Take them to prison, give them to the jailer, and say, here, don't just put them in jail, but lock them up. Chain them down. Put them in stocks. They're not going anywhere. You know, we read about Peter early on in Acts. What happened with Peter? He was arrested, and he was chained between guards. Mm -hmm. But here, they just put them in stocks. So we'll stop right here tonight and we'll pick up with the Philippian jailer, which is something I'm sure all of us are familiar with and just a, a wonderful uh, evidence of God moving in people's lives and bringing uh, salvation. So we'll pick up with verse 25 next week and then we'll go from there. All right.